Sing along with our own congregation on hymn number 358, Rank by Rank Again We Stand. called together, called by bell and bird, called by daylight and breeze, called by the beat of our hearts to join again the living tradition we share, to answer again the call of mystery and wonder. Today with the world peace bell ringing from Newport, Kentucky, and loons calling in the Adirondacks, let us remember the first of our tradition's sources, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder, affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Good morning, and welcome to Community Unitarian Universalist Congregation at White Plains, New York, formerly Lenape Territory. I'm the Reverend Meredith Garman, minister, coming to you live from our congregation sanctuary. Good morning. I'm Tracy Brenneman, Community UU Religious Educator. Good morning. I'm Adam Kent, CUUC's Music Director, here at my piano in Manhattan. Welcome to this home of liberal religion, which upholds four truths. It's a blessing you were born. It matters what you do. Your experience of the divine is true. And you don't have to go it alone. So thank you for being here. It's good to be together. Our light is a shared beacon of hope. It's the Sunday at the end of the ninth full week of spring. The waxing gibbous flower moon will be full Tuesday night. On the Christian calendar, today is Pentecost Sunday, seven weeks after Easter, commemorating the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and other followers of Jesus. And this Wednesday is Vesak, celebrated in South and Southeast Asia, where it is known as Buddha Day, commemorating Siddhartha Gautama's birth, enlightenment and death, which all happened on the same date. 
but in different years, just to be clear. Happy Buddha Day anyway, Meredith. Thank you, Adam, though it should be noted that some branches of Buddhism honor Vesak as only the birthday, with the enlightenment and death being at other times of year, and still other branches place the birthday on April 8th. A special welcome to our visitors. If you're a first time visitor, we invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. You'll find a link to the order of service on our website at cucwp.org. There you will also find resources to help keep us connected during this time and a donate button. For May, our Share the Plate funds support Meals for Hope. We're able to take contributions via the donate button for your pledge, the plate share, and for the minister's discretionary fund. Now, board chair Joe Majak has some news and will then lead us in lighting our chalices. Hi, I'm Joe Majak. As the chair of the board for this congregation, I welcome you. As we break free of the grip of COVID-19, here is a spiritual reminder that we welcome you back just the way you are. We are also ready to lean forward together in healing whatever brokenness we sense around us. These words are from Blessing for Solitude by John O'Donohue with adaptations from Joe Majak. May you recognize in your life the presence, power, and light of your soul. May you realize that you are never alone, that your soul in its brightness and belonging connect you intimately with the rhythm of the universe. May you have respect for your individuality and difference. May you realize that the shape of your soul is unique, that you are fine just the way you are, and that behind the facade of your life, there is something beautiful and eternal happening. May you learn to see yourself with the same delight, pride, and expectation with which others see you in every moment. And now it's time to light the chalice. On the ninth Sunday of the season, we dedicate our chalice to the first source of the living tradition we share, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Please join with me in the chalice lighting words from Edward Everett Hale. I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. Thomas Emlyn was the first British preacher definitely to describe himself with the word Unitarian, though he didn't at first. At age 28, he began serving Wood Street Presbyterian Church in Dublin, but he had doubts about the Trinity. At age 38, he wrote to a friend, I cannot hope to continue here in my present post when I have once professed my views. Wishing to avoid both insincerity and controversy, he simply avoided mentioning the Trinity. Finally, at age 39, he was confronted why in 11 years of preaching he had never mentioned the Trinity. Emlyn acknowledged himself to be an Arian Unitarian and offered to resign. The congregation said, take a leave of absence instead, but critics of his theology attacked him fiercely. In response, Emlyn wrote, an humble inquiry into the scripture account of Jesus Christ, published later that same year, 1702. That book would be a great influence on Unitarian development. Its most immediate effect, however, was to get Emlyn expelled from the Dublin Presbytery and then arrested and convicted for blasphemy. He was fined a thousand pounds. Unable to pay the fine, he was jailed for two years until the fine was lowered. The first British preacher to call himself Unitarian was also the last person jailed in Britain for denial of the Trinity. 
in 1705 at age 42. Released from jail and with no established church willing to take him, he moved to London, gathered a small congregation, and frequently guest-preached at London's non-conforming congregations until the end of his days. Fifty years after his death, extracts from his humble inquiry were published in America, where they helped spark our emerging Unitarian movement. This is Claude Debussy's prelude Bruyere, or Heather, a flowering shrub noted for its cleansing properties. When I was looking for flower songs to use in our gathering music this morning, the music that plays from 9.50 to 10 while announcement slides roll, I was a little surprised at how many of the best known songs about that reference flowers are sad. I never promised you a rose garden is all about how life isn't, well, a rose garden. Along with the sunshine, there's going to be a little rain sometimes. You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore is a duet of a couple that's breaking up. You'd think I could learn how to tell you goodbye, they sing. Where Have All the Flowers Gone is a meditation on girls picking the flowers, then marrying husbands who turn into soldiers and fill graveyards. It is an eternal forlorn circle. Bette Midler's The Rose has an ultimate optimism. In the winter, far below the bitter frost, lies the seed that with the sun's love in the spring becomes the rose. But the song sure dwells a lot on that bitter frost, on some saying love is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed, and those times when the night has been too lonely and the road has been too long. I hadn't noticed it before, but flowers in popular culture are often tinged with melancholy. 
They represent both beauty and the passing of that beauty, as epitomized in that song from Zeffirelli's 1968 Romeo and Juliet, a rose will bloom and then will fade. Flowers represent the beauty and the sorrow of life. Cynthia Zarin's poem speaks of how we don't really know how to hold all of this, all the beauty and the sorrow that spills over us and spills the coffee. Here's the invocation. Flowers by Cynthia Zarin. This morning I was walking upstairs from the kitchen carrying your beautiful flowers. The flowers you brought me last night, calla lilies, and something else, I'm not sure what to call them, white flowers. Of course, you had no way of knowing. It has been years since I bought white flowers, but now you have, and here they are again. I was carrying your flowers, and a coffee cup, and a soft yellow handbag, and a book of poems by a Chinese poet, in which I had just read the words, Come or go, but don't just stand there in the doorway. As usual, I was carrying too many things. You would have laughed if you saw me. It seemed especially important not to spill the coffee as I usually do as I turned up the stairs inside the whorl of the house, as if I were walking up inside the lilies. I do not know how to hold all the beauty and sorrow of my life. Please join in singing now our sung invocation. Spirit of Truth. The mission of Community Unitarian Universalist Congregation is the covenant of this congregation. Would all the members and visitors who would like to affirm it along with me? We covenant to nurture each other in our spiritual journeys, foster compassion and understanding within and beyond our community, and engage in service to transform ourselves and our world. And now, Kim Force is going to tell us the story of the rose and the carnation in the rhythm of a traditional Peruvian samacueca. Rosa's 
Come with me as we travel to Prague, Czechoslovakia, in Europe, the year 1923. There was a Unitarian church. Now the building did not look at all like our church. In fact, it did not look like a church at all. It did not have a tall steeple reaching toward the sky like some churches do. It did not have massive doors carved of wood or windows of stained glass. It did not have a chalice, a piano, or flowers. The church had walls, a ceiling, a floor, a door, a few windows, and some hard wooden chairs. But thankfully, the church had people who came every Sunday, and they were the most important part of the church, because without people, any church is just a building, no matter how tall its steeple. The people of Prague had been through hard times. They had just recently been through four years of war. Many people in Prague had been divided about the war. Many had lost loved ones or had been hungry or scared. And even though the war had ended, many bad feelings still remained. The church also had a minister. His name was Norbert Chapek. Reverend Chapek had been the minister of this church for two years. Every Sunday he spoke to the people and they listened, sitting quietly on those hard wooden chairs. When he finished speaking, the people talked a little bit among themselves, and then they went home. And that was all. No music, no candles, no food. Now Reverend Chapek, he was a thinker, and he wondered sometimes if there might be something, perhaps just a little something more spiritual. He wrote some songs and the people sang them, and it helped, but something was still missing. The church went on as before. One spring morning, near the end of May, as Reverend Chapek was out for a walk, he noticed the birds singing and the flowers blooming and felt the sunshine on his face. How beautiful the world is! And then an idea came to him. The next Sunday, he asked all the people of the church to bring a flower or a budding branch to church the next week. Each person was to bring one. What kind, they asked. What color? What size? You choose, he said. Each of you choose what you like. And so the next Sunday, which felt like the first day of summer, the people came with flowers of all different colors and sizes and kinds. There were yellow and white daisies and red roses, blue asters, dark-eyed pansies, grape hyacinth, pink and purple, orange and gold, all the colors of the rainbow and more. Children helped arrange them and bring them forward to the front of the church. Flowers filled all the vases, and beauty filled their hearts. The church wasn't so plain anymore. They had created beauty together. Reverend Chapek spoke to the people, and they listened, sitting quiet and still in those hard wooden chairs. Those flowers are like us, he said. Different colors, different shapes, and different sizes each needing different kinds of care, but each beautiful, important, and special in its own way. He said a blessing of the flowers, which called for everyone in the room to see one another as family, despite differences, and to let the spirit of love unite them and help them live more joyfully. He invited each person to take a flower home with them when they left. A different flower than what they had brought. And when the service ended that day, the people turned and talked a little bit more among themselves. And maybe there was some laughter. And then they each chose a flower from the vases before they left and took it home as a gift from their church family. And each year at the start of summer, they did this again. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. 
We bring our whole selves to this space and here we find comfort, here we find support, here we find community. Giver of life, you know so deeply every possible human emotion. You are there as we witness the events, devastation, celebrations, joy, and heartbreak, which can cause our hearts to change. As we face another week in a world filled with innumerable tragedies, as well as hope-filled opportunities, help us to hear where the spirit is calling us, give us hope, lead us into the work, teach us how to live in peace. Our world needs the peace that only we can create. We mourn the more than 240 lives lost in the escalated conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. And we join the world in hoping the ceasefire holds, knowing that peace can be fragile and tensions are still high. We pray for our siblings in Mumbai, India, where a barge with 261 people sank during a cyclone. As rescue efforts continue, we pray for those waiting for news of loved ones who are still missing. And we pray for this country as legislators in Texas continue efforts in re-education to recast history playing down references to slavery and anti-Mexican discrimination that are part of the state's founding. Nearly a dozen other states also seek to ban or limit teaching about the enduring legacies of slavery and segregationist laws. We also watch the Supreme Court as the justices agree to hear a case from Mississippi this fall that could challenge hard-won reproductive rights and rights over a woman's bodily autonomy. We pray for those whose, whose humanity is denied by others, just as we pray for those who try to oppress others and in doing so, lose sight of their own humanity. With gratitude, we see young people receiving COVID vaccines now that they're available to those 12 and older and we hope that soon there will be some form of protection available for the youngest among us, as our children are a vital part of our community. With gratitude, we lift up sharing and learning happening in small groups discussing the UUA Common Read, Breathe, a letter to my sons by Imani Perry. We embrace these conversations as spiritual deepening, as affirmation of our faith, as opportunities to be in right and authentic relationship with each other. And this afternoon, we celebrate the ordination of Petra Toms, longtime member of this congregation. Our hearts are full of, our hearts are full of joy for Petra and her calling. Her ministry enriches us all. Giver of life, shine your light, into the darkest places and depths of pain. Where love is denied, let love break through. Where justice is destroyed, let righteousness rule. Where hope is crucified, let faith persist. Where peace is no more, let integrity live on. Where truth is denied, let the struggle continue. Where laughter has dried up, let music play on. Where fear paralyzes, let forgiveness break through. Offer us, in the words of Trippetta Mason, each day another chance to practice being human. May it be so. For all that has been said, and for all we hold in our hearts, we observe a moment of silence.
Edward McDowell's Eternally Fresh to a Wild Rose, the opening piece of his woodland sketches. Here's a slogan to remember, to repeat to yourself every morning, aspire without attachment. We do have preferences and intentions for security, comfort, enjoyment, creative expression, physical and mental health, connection, respect, love, self-actualization, spiritual development. But is your pursuit driven and stressed? or characterized by outer effort and inner peacefulness. If it's driven and stressed, then you are attached to an outcome. There's craving and thus suffering. On the other hand, aspiration, working hard toward your goals without getting hung up on the results, feels good, and it helps you stretch and grow without worry. Failure except for what you might learn from it, is beside the point. The victory is in the doing, not the outcome. Aspiration is about liking, while attachment is about wanting. And these involve separate systems in your brain. Liking what is pleasant and disliking what is unpleasant, that's life. Trouble comes up when we tip into the craving and strain inherent in wanting, wanting, wanting what's pleasant to continue and what's unpleasant to end. This slogan, Aspire Without Attachment, will help attune you to the differences between liking and wanting. The difference shows up in your body, emotions, attitudes, and thoughts. Liking feels open, relaxed, and flexible, while wanting feels tight, pressed, contracted, and fixated. For tips on how better to aspire without attachment, see the post at cucmatters.org. The link is in your e-communitarian. Singer of life, all flowers are songs. Please sing along with the chancel choir of the First Unitarian Church of Oakland, our hymn number 196, Singer of Life.
Jesus had a sermon about flowers and about birds. It's the Consider the Lilies sermon, included in both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Scholars say the word translated as lilies refers generally to wild flowers, flowers of the field. Here's the version in Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? If then you are not able to do so small a thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink. And do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. The kingdom we may read as kingdom. Strive for Compassion, an active wish that a being not suffer, and a feeling of sympathetic concern. Compassion is your ability to experience others' feelings from joy to sorrow with a desire to help. Compassion makes real the kingdom of God. Jesus says, be compassionate and your material needs will be provided. We are surrounded by beauty. The springtime flowers shine forth the beauty of creation, and they don't get it by working. They're, they're beautiful just by being what they are. There's a scene in Monty Python's Life of Brian where Brian finds himself speaking to crowds and delivers a version of Jesus's Consider the Lilies speech. Brian's audience can't get clear on whether Brian is criticizing flowers and birds because of their slothful scrounging or whether he's lifting them up and praising them. What's the matter with the birds? They shout back at him. He says the birds are scrounging, they say. And when Brian shifts his example, they say, he's having a go with the flowers now. Is he criticizing or praising the birds and flowers? Monty Python's source material presents us with the same ambiguity. On the one hand, Jesus seems to be commending the birds and flowers to us, urging us to be like them, stop our worrisome working, and trust in the grace of the world to provide. So the flowers and the birds, they're the smart ones, the enlightened ones. They're the model for us to emulate. Even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these, he says. And then he turns around and says, no, it is we humans who are much more valuable. Of how much more value are you than the birds? How much more will God clothe you? So we're the ones of more value, but it's the birds and flowers that are getting it right. But if they're the ones getting it right, what is it that makes us more valuable? What seems to distinguish us is that we work and toil and worry. Is that what gives us so much more value? then why is the wise teacher Jesus telling us to stop the working and the worrying? The spiritual task, the call of the Spirit, is this paradoxical one, to love and accept yourself, all of yourself, including the parts of yourself that don't accept and love you. You are a flower, blooming, and colorful, and a delight to behold, every one of you, every one of us. And you also toil. There is work to be done, and you do it. Flowers don't toil and worry, says Jesus. Well, now, wait a minute. 
Flowers work. All day long, they're working through their flower to-do lists. Photos photosynthesize the sunlight to produce the sugars, convert the sugars to energy, metabolize nutrients from the soil. There's air to be taken in, carbon to be sequestered, oxygen to be released, and seeds to be produced, future generations to be provided for. You have problems, flowers have problems. Not enough warmth, not enough rain, poor soil. And flowers make such adjustments as they can, turning their petals toward the sun, pushing their roots further outward. The lesson of flowers isn't exactly do nothing. Adjust and respond as your ability allows. It's just that there's no need for worries. Jesus links toil and worry and suggests that flowers do neither while humans do too much of both. But toil and worry don't have to be linked. Flowers, in their way, toil, but they don't worry. Can we go about our work? the way that flowers go about theirs, simply doing what needs to be done, calmly, radiantly, non-anxiously. To put it in the terms of this week's spiritual practice, flowers aspire without attachment. Notice the beauty and be the beauty. That's the lesson of the flowers. And so I now invite you to bask in the beauty of flowers and of this community, to appreciate Kim Force, who made the slides from the pictures that you submitted, and appreciate each other for finding and sharing beauty, and enjoy the artistry of Adam Kent. This is what community looks like. Thank you, Reverend Meredith. This is the Dance of the Lilies from Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet. Sweet Lavender from Edward McDowell's New England Idols.
also by Edward McDowell, to a water lily from his woodland sketches. The Chrysanthemum by Scott Joplin. Thank you. 
there's a cumulative effect, don't you find that uh, one one picture is is very pretty, but uh, it becomes more powerful as they keep rolling by. My goodness. The poet and Unitarian Universalist minister Lynn Unger exclaims, what a gathering, the purple tongues of iris licking out at spikes of lupine, <clears throat> the orange crepe skirts of poppies lifting over buttercup and daisy. Who can be grim in the face of such abundance? <laughs> there is nothing to compare, no need for beauty to compete. The voluptuous rhododendron and plain grass are equally filled with themselves, equally declare the miracles of color and form. This is what community looks like. This vibrant jostle stem by stem declaring the marvelous joining. This is the face of communion. The incarnation once more gracefully resurrected from winter. Hold these things together in your sight. Purple, crimson, magenta, blue. You will be feasting on this long after the flowers are gone. Our Time for All Ages story was about Norbert Chapek. I will tell a little bit more about his story. He was born in Bohemia in what is now the Czech Republic in 1870. He was born into a Roman Catholic family, wanted to be a priest, became disillusioned with the Catholic Church, and at age 18 joined the Baptist Church and was ordained as a minister. His writings attracted unfavorable attention from German authorities, and in 1914, he fled to the United States, returning to Prague in 1921. During those seven years in the U.S., Chapek was introduced to Unitarianism, and was also introduced to Maya Achtevek, another Czech expatriate. With American Baptists accusing him of heresy, and at Maya's encouragement, Norbert switched over and became Unitarian, joined the Essex County, our Essex County congregation in Orange, New Jersey. When he and Maya returned to Prague, they started the Unitarian Church there. And he felt the need for a symbolic ritual that would bind people more closely together. The format had to be one that would not alienate any who had forsaken other religious traditions. The traditional Christian communion service with bread and wine was unacceptable to members of his congregation because of their strong reaction against the Catholic faith. So he turned to the native beauty of their countryside for elements of a communion that would be genuine to them. Today, his flower communion service is carried out in Unitarian churches all over the world. As our time for all ages today said, those flowers are like us. Different colors, different shapes, different sizes, each needing different kinds of care, but each beautiful, important, and special in its way. When the Nazis came to power, they came after Unitarians too. Norbert Chopek died in 1942 in a Nazi concentration camp. Another Unitarian Universalist minister, poet, minister and poet, Richard Gilbert, put it this way. The flowers have the gift of language. At the occasion of birth, they are buds before bursting. At the ceremony of love, they unite two lovers in beauty. At the occasion of death, they remind us how lovely is life. Silent messengers of hope. In the dark depths of a death camp, they speak the light of life. In the face of cruelty, they speak of courage. In the experience of ugliness, they bespeak the persistence of beauty. They transport the human voice on winds of beauty. They lift the melody of song to our ears. They paint through the eye and hand of the artist. Their fragrance binds us to sweet-smelling earth. Norbert Chopek, Norbert Chopek himself wrote these words to consecrate the flowers 
before they were distributed among the people. Infinite spirit of life, we ask thy blessing on these thy messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of those most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do thy work in this world. May it be so. Amen. I invite you now to sing our hymn number 305, De Colores. We join with the Unitarian Universalists of Statesboro and Coastal Georgia. Please join Joe Majak for our chalice extinguishing words as you extinguish your chalice at home. Please say with me these words as we extinguish our chalices. As we extinguish our chalice, may it glow in our hearts, renewing our spirits, joining us to the forces of life, and awakening us to the transcendent wonder. Because those who came before we are, in spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, 
we too dream. Let us go remembering to praise. To live in the moment. To love mightily. To bow to the mystery. Go in hope. Go in love. Go in peace. Heliotrope Bouquet is an example of community in the musical world. Uh, Scott Joplin had a younger friend, Louis Chauvin, who was a great improviser at the piano, although he could not read or write music. Heliotrope Bouquet is a collaboration between the two of them. Joplin apparently wrote down the first two sections, which were Chauvin's music, and then added a couple of his own. Mm -hmm. 